And um, now we'll go on to tab D. There's no action. Uh, tab E, uh, approval of the financial report. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Chairman Abeza, Vice Chair Siegel, President Guzman. I'd like to um, start actually at tab E7 for this reason. Uh, the MDNA report, the management discussion analysis, indicates pretty much that in um, August the institution ran nominally. There are no major surprises. Uh, revenues and expenses are as expected. They're in line with one year ago. And uh, uh, with the exception of specific questions, I thought it might make more sense to start at tab E7, look at a couple of specific points that I think that the board might uh, be interested in and have, uh, have comment or guidance on. Um, as of the end of August, as has been the pattern for about the last five years, we had in excess of $20 million sitting in a non-interest bearing checking account with Wells Fargo. And as the board has been aware for um, uh, some months, the bulk of those funds are the result of the uh, latest public uh, bond issue that was passed. We also have had some debt service funds. We paid some debt service last month, which is a variance from approximately $5 million from our cash balances last month. And then we have a few million dollars, uh, about $2.5 million that are unrestricted discretionary funds that we, in essence, operate the institution with. And those are norms. Uh, you might notice at the lower right of tab E7 that the projected next month coverage for uh, September is fairly thin at $213,000. The good news is that's typical of this time of year for us over the past several years, and it's a positive number, which is very good news for the, for the CFO. Uh, we'll have a, a few rocky weeks before we get to our next major appropriation. I might point out, by the way, on tab E8, just for the sake of comfort for board members, because it certainly comforts your chief financial officer, this is a very typical pattern for the institution, so there's nothing unusual here. Now going back to tab E7, um, one of the significant events that occurred at the last board meeting was the board's approval of the uh, change of signers that the board passed at the uh, last meeting, allowing the president, the vice president of academic affairs, and the chief financial officer to serve as our primary signatories. That allowed me to be in discussion with Elena Garcia, our Wells Fargo um, uh, uh, corporate banker, uh, if you will, our business banker in Albuquerque. And as of last week, we have started the process of uh, changing the investment policy by which we handle this $20 million a month that this institution has in the bank. Now, for reasons that I think are probably recession-related, um, the emphasis of the institution's cash management for about the last six fiscal years has been almost entirely, in fact, it's been entirely on liquidity. And that's not a bad policy, I want to point out. Uh, if you've ever run out of money paying your bills at home in the third week of the month, then everybody understands why liquidity is an important objective. But when we are talking 15 or $20 million, sweeping into a nominally interest-bearing, safe, secure, fully collateralized account represents ten to $20,000 of revenue to this institution for which we do nothing but basically make a decision and manage our money wisely. So this is the, uh, this is the intention, a uh, process that we're actually underway. We've initiated this week. Uh, Wells Fargo is a highly experienced, very deep and broad uh, institutional banker nationwide. They have a very strong institutional investment policy. We have very strict rules in New Mexico regarding collateralization of public funds, how they're invested, and those earnings that we would receive by sweeping funds into an interest-bearing account must track the purpose for which those public funds, uh, those revenues were raised. Um, however, with all of those restrictions and safeguards in place, it remains that while we have $20 million sitting in a checking account, uh, we are doing nothing with it. Uh, in the time since I met with the board a month ago, we would have earned about $18,000 if we had been moving this direction. So all that is to say, the reasons for the liquidity policy were sound. They got the institution through some rough years with the recession. 
but uh, it seems to me that it makes sense for our money to be working for us and so that's that's the direction we're, we're intending to go and again um, uh, we I believe policy structure in place allows for this already uh, the rules are very very conservative so uh, this, this should be a, a positive outcome I'll report we won't take any major actions that the board is not aware of and over it, it will take us some weeks to establish this so hopefully by next month I'll be giving you more uh, more specifics about uh, what we intend to intend to do um, let's move forward to tab e10 and interesting we're starting to see a couple of interesting trends develop in uh, in August we're two months into the fiscal year and I want to point out I'm sorry e11 at the lower right of e11 uh, all last year, the president was telling you about budget changes she was, uh, she was making, and I appreciate her comment earlier that uh, Dr. De La Rosa and I, working with Randy Grissom and Dr. Gonzalez and, and others, we, we have a very strong budget team and we're, we're developing greater clarity day by day in regard to how all those things worked, and this again, information we'll share with the board as we work through the budget process. But one interesting thing that appeared on this month's report that is different from the last month's report is that if you look at the lower right of E11, you start to see the results of changes and allocations that the president directed with board approval during the last school year. And so you notice, for instance, there is a significant percentage increase between prior year and current year in regard to funds that have been devoted to instruction. That's a 4% increase. Academic <coughs> support, you see a large increase, 8%. Now about 75% of that number uh, our allocations for the investment incentive that the board approved uh, last year, I believe we had 47 employees who accepted that investment in, uh, incentive. So you're beginning to see those, those, those flows. Uh, student services, a 2% two, two increase in, in uh, funds that flowed last month. And then you notice as you work down that list, you see a 1% uh, decrease in POM, plant operations and, and maintenance. So I believe, and I say this somewhat tentatively because two months is, is um, obviously not much of the year to make a strong assertion, but I think it's an interesting trend that I believe we'll see develop as the school year progresses, that you see this, this movement that the board and the president worked on last year toward moving monies more toward the instructional side and devoting less to the physical plant and perhaps less to administrative salaries and that type of thing and, and more toward uh, teachers and classrooms and the people that, that oversee them, which uh, again from the switching hats to my teacher role a little bit I think is a very student-centered objective for us to have uh, going forward with the next year's budget. Looking ahead to E12, um, we just really have good news with the auxiliaries. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the kids' campus, the kids' campus, because of changes that were made uh, over the summer uh, regarding uh, staffing, uh, regarding enrollment policies, um, changes to the way uh, payment programs work. Uh, the kids' campus is doing very well at this point in the year, and so is uh, the, the combined food services uh, unit. Uh, the East End Eatery and the main cafeteria are now functioning under one, one unit and are jointly and, uh, and in the aggregate are doing very well. Now when we saw these preliminary uh, figures uh, last week, Bob McWilliams on behalf of Maggie Zen and uh, Jerry and Bezad asked me to um, uh, caution, I think would be the best word, the board, that these numbers probably will not hold through the the year. I think what we can safely say is that last year's deficit positions will be much smaller. Mm -hmm. We don't know if they will be eradicated altogether, but I think it's important to, to note that it's the, the kids campus will not do a $250,000 surplus this year. These are tentative figures and you'll see these flows um, ebb and flow. Um, what is hard to mathematically avoid when you project out through the end of this fiscal year is that when you compare to last year and prior years, both of these enterprise units are, are just doing much better than they, they did in the past. Um, I have a question there. Yes. I thought at the last board meeting we weren't going to have any deficit in the kids' campus. Well, yes, yeah, Ms. Siegel, again, I'm, it's, it's out of an abundance of caution I'm saying that because just, just from having done this for a long time, two months into a fiscal year, I learned early in my career not to announce to 
oversight boards of, of any type what will happen in 10 months. So just out of an abundance of caution, uh, I believe mathematically, and when I told Bob McWilliams the other, this, he's at a conference this week or he'd be here defending this himself, he said with a stricken face, please don't go in and guarantee the board that we'll have surpluses. Mathematically, if trends hold, after talking to Maggie, Maggie has a fabulous spreadsheet that she's running internally. It's really good information where she's tracking line, individual line items. And when you simply do the math on this, it's very hard to avoid that I think these two enterprise units, unless something significant occurs that changes the way they're operating, I think we're going to be looking at marginal surpluses at the end of the year. It may be razor thin, but I don't think it'll be the deficits we were looking at before. But this is still one-fourth, one, one so yeah. we have saved uh, three times what we paid last time in subsidies. Yes, I, I really, I think, again, as with the comments on E8 about change to instruction, I think what we're seeing is the initial financial results of policies that were in play between the executive branch and the board throughout last year. And we're actually starting to see now these sure. things that were talked about and were perspective, we're actually seeing them start to, to start to occur. Yeah. So. And, and some of the things that you're familiar that we've done with the Early Childhood Center is we increased the number of students that each of the classrooms, and what we did is um, we used to just have NAEYC guideline numbers in students. And so the, the, uh, the, what we did is we said, okay, if NAEYC says seven two-year-olds should be the maximum, and New Mexico says 10 two-year-olds should be the maximum, we'll be at eight. And so we took the Cadillac model, which is NAEYC, which is what we were doing, ascribing to, and very, very few people are able to do that. And then the New Mexico model that is much more lenient and sometimes too lenient, and then we went right down the middle. That was one change that we made right away last year. The other change that we've made this year is that we added another classroom. And we added the classroom in three and four year olds because that's where the high demand is. And, and so now we're full. And, and when you add students to you know, the, the, um, the expense then becomes less and, and, your, and your income is more. And, and so in, in early childhood, uh, I think we've done, I, I think that we will not have the deficits that we had before. I think the, the difference in the, in the East Wing and in the, in the cafeteria, um, Patricia uh, and Randy have worked really hard uh, making sure that the instructional piece remains instructional, but that we don't deviate uh, as we were last year with offering other things that then the cafeteria could offer. So what we've tried to do is bring in collaboration uh, between the two as a modus operandi, uh, and, and that seems to be working very well. Bazad uh, has worked very hard to be able to be with the East Wing and the cafeteria and everyone working together. So, so this has been um, a work of love from everyone involved. So I noticed Maggie isn't here, so I guess. She's exhausted, no. <laughs> because if this, this is July's report, and I don't believe those pre-K classrooms opened until August. August. This would be August 31. So this money, so. No, this is yeah. August this is, 31. This is, this is August 31, Miss Siegel. Well, what I, then I have the wrong report because I'm looking at July 31. E13? Yeah, okay, August 30. E13 says August 31st. Okay, how come I don't have the right? Because I'm in September, yeah. so that's right. Let me get. Okay. All right, let me yes, just and, get and, yours because and part of part of the reason for my commentary, this is part of the discussion with 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 Bob and, and with Maggie, is that looking back at the um, at the July report again, uh, it's very easy to a certain first month. While we have a huge change from projected deficit, mm -hmm. so again, it's just a matter of being cautious. We we have a real advantage right now 
in that we have a vice president of academic affairs who can see things as a CFO, and we have a CFO who can see things as a school teacher, as a, as a college instructor. So, so Randy and I, it's, it's possible for us to look at some of these and say, okay, what are we actually talking about? What are we really trying to do here? So I think the balance, again, I think what, what we're seeing reflected is a balance. Uh, we, we cannot have an, an instructional unit that functions entirely as a business enterprise. That's not the nature of what we do here. And at the same time, we can't have a business enterprise on campus that operates without a focus on instruction. When those two things are balanced correctly, uh, Jerry sent a, a very eloquent email talking about how he cut expenses. And, and in general, we would say in the for-profit world, increase the profitability of the enterprise, which is, I think is good for everybody. So if more focused on students and, um, and in general, uh, in general doing, doing better. Yeah. Ms. And Siglin. we're going to, and, and then next we're going to look at the planetarium uh, because we've lost $71,000 and we should not be losing on the planetarium. So our philosophy, and, and Brian is right with us, is auxiliaries should make us money, should not cost us money. And last year, auxiliary cost us over $700,000. And that was lower than the year before. And so we have been trying to lower it and lower it. And I think this year, with the cafeteria, because that loss was 400000 was East Wing and cafeteria together. So if we, can, if we can all work together in the cafeteria and East Wing and then lower, we, the goal is for auxiliaries to make money not to lose money. And I think by the end of this year, if not next year, we will be achieving that instead of auxiliaries costing us a million dollars. One, uh, one final comment, ladies and gentlemen, about the, the audit. And I was waiting to see. Ms. Siegel, did you want me to field a well, okay. question. I have another question, but my computer now is only in September instead okay. of he has, the, he has it there. But, so I have Andrea's, but oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so with the de, when the delinquent taxes come in, because we don't really know what our um, total revenue is going to be from the property taxes because there's the potential for delinquency do those get booked every month or as they come in or how does that work we have we have two major allocation flows one of which is our our monthly state allocation which is about a million dollars a month and uh, in all honesty in some months that really helps us keep keep the lights on <laughs> because those are those are our bread and butter flows mm -hmm. twice a year we have our property tax allocations and I, I concur, we really don't know what the amount's going to be. The good news is, is we have some advance notice. We have some idea before those come in, so the planning is done. That's why on the E8 chart, if you look at this over an expanded version, you see this wave going. And so what will happen is here in December and January, uh, this is another reason for us to have a good investment policy, mm -hmm. that at, at least a, a different investment policy. We'll have many millions of dollars that will be sitting for some time that we will work off of for about five or six months. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to point out, too, in that context, the reason that a liquidity policy and checking account is a, can be a very dangerous animal is that when the board and the executive staff and the financial people are all seeing $32 million sitting there, there's a sort of sense of invincibility. Sure, go ahead and approve it. We can get it done. And then, of course, you get six months down the road, and you're thinking, what do we do Friday for payroll? So, so an objective, I would say, for the auxiliary units, two things that would really be outstanding for the institution, and we're there, and because it was, this is work that's been done previously, but again, by the board, the executive staff, but, but this is what I think will shape up. One would be to smooth their flows so that it's not a, a constant rise and fall, and the other would be to have a situation where we both satisfy a student with a cup of coffee and get five cents of that cup of coffee to plow back into the institution, and now you're rocking with an auxiliary enterprise. Right. Mm -hmm. And so those are, that's what I think we're seeing shape up. Mm -hmm. Okay, but did, the, but did you answer my question? The, so when last, last meeting, when we changed the amount in our fund balance based on the mill levy amount that was, hadn't been carried over or picked up. Right. So that was an accrued 
mill levy amount, right? That was the estimate of what we're going to get, the balance of what we're going to get. I'm not or? sure. Are we talking um, if I'm if I'm recalling the correct thing that we talked about. Yes, that, you that, that is correct. Dollars. It's an accrual that, that well, no, that's that's if I remember correctly, that's a different number. That was that was the bottom of a budget projection roll forward in the 2012 audit. If I remember correctly, that was the $7.6 million number that we realized, or 7.3 that should have been 5.6 and had a $2.7 million different. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and honestly would have to go back and check just to make sure what I'm saying is, is correct, that the mill levy accrual is a different issue from that. Okay, so my question is then, are we booking the delinquent taxes as they come in? Um, it depends on the on the allocation. Generally, they are booked on a cash basis, but some of those are accrued as we are aware of them. It depends on the it depends on the allocation. Mm -hmm. So they're not uh, accrued. Which, which which is to say which is to say that in effect, in effect, when you look at the bottom of page E seven. projecting forward through September, for example, our, our unrestricted revenue, this is a somewhat uh, fictitious tool that is being used for internal purposes only because mm -hmm. the fact is that as the cash comes in, we are going to book that million dollars when it comes in. There are other funds that are previously recorded that are available to us in our checking account, and there are other accruals that we are, that we are waiting on. So this number at the bottom, in fact, this, this form, and I may, may adjust this corner a little bit because I'm a little concerned that what it represents is not this really. This may not be the cash balance, the actual cash balance. Well, the indication, the indication of this at the bottom is, is that we are, we're good to cover our bills plus $213,000, mm -hmm. which really should just scare the governing board and the president to death. Reality is that's not exactly the case. Reality is it will take about $3 million to operate this month. We have in excess of those funds available to us. We have pending allocations coming, and then we have the monthly cash receipt that will cover that. Mm -hmm. so. so you don't accrue the total amount anticipated from the mill? Um, I would say if we're using accrual the same way, I would say yeah, no. We do. We're, I would say we are not going to book an entry to record the entirety of that, that income until realized. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, now, the issue is the word accrued and the word realized. And I, I really am not trying to be cagey. It's just that this is, this is the kind of hair we split with the auditors. Is, is, so at the point in time that we can realize uh, those those tax allocations as receipts, we're going to record them and report them to the board as available to us. And to, uh, prior to that time, probably not. In regard to the mill, the mill levy. But uh, something that we may bring to you uh, next month, I'd like to hear if you would be interested in, is that we did have the two million dollar uh, surplus last year from savings. And there are still a lot of um, remodels that, that need to be done. And, and the monies from the bond, from the 2010 bond, are gone. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to assess how much more we thought we would get done because there are faculty, there are staff that are disappointed because they thought that their areas were going to be redone, and in fact, never we never got to them. And so what I'd like to do uh, in working with Brian and, and, and uh, Henry is to look and see, given that we did the savings of $2 million last year, what it would do if we, instead of putting it in the, in the, in the fund, in the permanent fund, we, we allocated to finishing out what faculty and stuff thought that they would want that they would have and where did that two million come from savings well, it's, it's an that's an interesting question very quickly something I think the board needs to know when I arrived on on August 1st the first question I asked my staff is have we got a 
balance sheet, an income statement, and a budget report. And everybody looked at me and started laughing out loud, literally. Actually, we were in a meeting. And they said, what are you kidding? So that's what started my journey with learning about Santa Fe Community College's banner experience. So I did what I thought any good jazz player would do, Mr. Chairman. And that is that about six weeks ago, I got together every expert of every type of every high-powered office on this campus I could get. And that's Dr. Gonzalez and, and, uh, and uh, Janet Wise, communications director, and, and Randy Grissom, about eight or nine of us, all of whom have expertise in, in the institution from different perspectives. And the other guy we got was Josh Morimoto, who's the fastest typist on a keyboard ever in Excel. And we've been up in the fishbowl, well, up over in the fishbowl, for six weeks, tearing apart the budget from last year, trying to figure out why the president kept saying to the board, we saved $2 million, and the board kept saying, we can't see the $2 million, where is it? And the president would say, I'm not sure, because I can't see it either. Yeah. And so I'm delighted to tell the board, we know where it is, yeah. we know what the budget looks like, uh, we have finally been able to unpack it, we understand what's wrong in Banner, we're in the process of fixing it, mm -hmm. and I think probably by January you'll have a, a fiscal 15 budget process that finally the board, the executive staff, finance, and the academic leaders will be able to say, okay, we all know what we're doing here, we can, we can see it. It's not been easy, but, but the savings are in fact there. Yep. We do have, we know of a couple of different places other than uh, the R&R budget, which is kind of sacrosanct ground for capital outlays, but we do have, there is budget that got lost last year because the program codes were incorrect for some of these reno renovations. So we're making great, great progress. One final comment about the audit, I think it's very important for the board to, uh, to know. Santa Fe Community College for, uh, uh, I've examined, uh, I guess, a decade of publicly promulgated audit reports. And it is my sincere belief and it is my analytical conclusion that Santa Fe Community College has more than once had auditors come to the end of an audit and announce to the finance department, the president, and the board, here is what we are going to publicly say about you. And there has not been a level of expertise where someone who understood the auditor's language could provide some pushback and say, no, wait a minute, we're not, we're not sure we agree and we're not sure necessarily that that represents the operations of this institution. And I believe last year that in, in some respects that was reflected in the 2012 audit, which was an exceedingly harsh audit by, uh, by any standard. I say this having been an auditor since December 1988. So on Friday, I want the board to know that when we had our preliminary meeting and the, the auditors said, well, here are the five or six things we're deeply concerned about, I pushed back hard on several of those and basically said to the auditors, no, wait a minute, this needs to be a fair representation of what we've tried to do. Uh, for example, if we have revealed something to you that we want you to look at, it's kind of unreasonable to come back two weeks later, write a finding and say, hey, okay, we, we think you did the wrong thing here when we told, told you. So all this is to say, I just want the board to know that, that going, going forward on my watch at, at least, uh, we're going to talk to the auditors honestly about what they're saying about the institution to the very best of my uh, ability um, before we have adverse audit findings that are presented. I was very pleased, by the way, because there was movement in the conversation to hear the, uh, the audit partners say to the board tonight, well, you know, we're, we're looking at these other areas and we're kind of backing off the word material because these are very serious things. Uh, and I just want the board to know we are well represented in the audit and uh, you can't guarantee the outcome of an audit. They must be independent and objective. But I do want you to know that Santa Fe Community College will not be laying down while the report's written this year. We, we are participating in the process. So there you are. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Anyone? Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. We have to approve it. So I move that we approve the financial report. Do we have second. a second? Second. Um, all those in favor of approving the financial report? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Is, are you. Are you okay, Linda? No, I'm just having a lot of trouble with this new um, program. I just ended up back in September. <laughs> <laughs> Well, mine died, so. <laughs> okay, well, I, I cannot share it with both of you, no. but I'd be happy to. 
Okay. Okay, should we continue then? Chair. All right, uh, so tab F is um, information items. And um, uh, we already did the auditor's entrance conference. Is that correct? Does everyone feel okay yes. that we've done that? And uh, we've done the county presentation of future plans. Uh, do we need to say that anything publicly on that? No. There no? Okay. And uh, now the that we just did the funding formula with uh, Mr. Danny Earp. Uh, strategic planning update. Morimoto-san. <laughs> Is that appropriate? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the board, it's my pleasure to introduce to you, um, well, you already know Susan Lemke. She is the Director of Continuous Quality Improvement and Policy Analysis. And I have recently passed on the torch to Susan to lead the strategic planning efforts. So I'm going to leave to her uh, to give the board update. Thank you. I'm not entirely sure of the protocol. So um, you have in your uh, packets, you have the, uh, the summary of the update. Uh, and did this make it into the packet, Yash? Okay. Okay. So um, uh, just briefly to, to go over the uh, the update, and if you have any questions, uh, I've working on getting up to speed. Uh, it's been a quick transition, um, but we're moving along with the strategic plan. Uh, we have um, have held uh, since the last meeting a strategic planning session with the staff members, uh, similar to um, the one that we held with the faculty members during the convocation period, uh, to gather staff input um, and suggestions on developing strategies to uh, fulfill our, our uh, strategic objectives and, and move our KPIs. Uh, that was a very successful effort and we had a really, it was a, a really remarkably productive productive session. Um, I think people came out of it feeling really good um, and people worked very hard actually to um, put their thoughts together. So now we are going to um, send off the strategy recommendations that we've received from both the faculty and the staff uh, to uh, four groups that have been formed, one for each of the long-term goals in the strategic plan. Uh, those strategies then will be vetted by these groups um, and proposals will come back on which strategies the college should implement that are most likely to help us uh, accomplish our objectives for uh, the next several years. Uh, in the course of... Um, I know that I know that a number of meetings have been held, Dr. Guzman, Yash, um, Randy and others have met with a number of organizations mm -hmm. in the community to gather input from uh, various constituencies on their interests um, in relation to the strategic plan to share our goals and objectives with them and to find out ways that we could work together to accomplish mutual goals. Uh, we had a remarkably good meeting um, with uh, folks who, I, I guess I would call them service providers, mm -hmm for the indigent community in Santa Fe. And, um, and that was on uh, October 9th. And we have, is, do they have a copy of this at all? No. It's not in there, okay. All right, so we'll, we can get you, the, to, we can get you the, uh, the report from the meeting, but we had representatives from uh, about a dozen organizations, um, uh, including the, uh, the county, and um, and then a number of, of agencies, including St. Elizabeth's and, is that up there? No. Yeah. Um, St. Elizabeth's Food Depot, Adelante, La Familia. So a lot of these larger agencies that work with, um, that work with this community. And it was, it was a, a, an ex incredibly positive meeting. Um, I think that f folks were extremely interested in uh, hearing what our initiatives are, and also really working with us and thinking about ways that we can work to better serve the needs of the community. And in fact, I had a few people who ended up, who were planning to attend, who could not attend, and, and they just, they called and were profusely apologetic that they were not able to come. So it was really nice to see um, how anxious folks are to work with the college to think about how we can serve this community. So um, we talked about a variety of possibilities and 
Uh, Dr. Guzman has asked that um, I come and present the results of that meeting to the executive team to talk about how we could take some of these ideas that were discussed and think about are there some ways that we can actually translate some of these things into action. And um, to the extent that it's appropriate, we'll look at working these into our strategic planning initiatives specifically as well. Um, uh, the, the last, the sort of last major thing that's happening with the strategic plan is that we're working on developing a comprehensive communications plan. Uh, and Janet is heading up that initiative. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings and talking about ways where the primary focus is internal uh, to make sure that folks here certainly are familiar with our mission, our mission, um, our uh, vision and, and our um, Values and long-term goals. Values. <laughs> Thank you. And long-term goals. Um, and we're just we've we've been doing a lot of brainstorming, thinking about ways to to reach um, this community. And again, it's you know folks play such different roles here and and um, are in such different employment situations to really um, get the word out in a comprehensive way. And but we really realize how important it is that that folks are clearly versed in the mission of the institution, that um, everyone here is thinking first and foremost about why we're all here and how what they do relates to the overall mission of the institution. So that's moving along nicely as well. Well, and I, I would just like to let the board know that um, I felt that Susan's skills uh, were really underutilized in the testing center. And so we, we are hiring a lower level coordinator for the testing center. It's a very important center. Uh, but Yash and I spoke. And we want the strategic plan to be a living plan and a changing plan and a plan that the institution uh, makes a difference with. And so we needed someone to lead it. And Susan is very ably leading that. Uh, and then Jill, Jill Carlson is leading AQIP and the uh, continuous improvement. So I really see this year um, a, a much uh, an, a year of much more involvement in the realization of the strategic plan and in our improvement of AQIP processes. And um, just this year, you've seen that we started talking about veterans. And we have a veteran center. We will be having a Native American uh, coordinator that we'll bring in. And I think with Susan having talked with the, with the groups that work with the indigent populations, we want to include all these populations in the facilities and in the, uh, and what we're doing with the college. So thank you, Susan. Yeah, well, my, my focus really has always been the community. Mm -hmm. I really feel that, you know, having grown up here and having worked with, with indigent, you know, the community and stuff, I, I, um, I just really feel really so positive and, and just energized by what you say because that to me, is, that's my population. You know, that's my population. And, and um, I can't get away from it. I can't get away from it because these are all people that I've grown up with and people that I know and 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 people that have come out of it and, and people that are still in it, you know, and, and I think the community college community that, you know, we're, we're really a strong part of that. So thank you and continue that to please, you know, that I think it's so important that they know they being everyone, everyone outside of the college. Yes, we have the staff and the faculty and, and all, you know, but the community so that they really strongly feel that they're part of our familia, they're of our familia you know, that they're part of who we are because we really are. That, that's what we're here for. That's what, you know, really, that's what each one of us are here for, you know, to, to serve the community. And, and I think that's to have it be part of our strategic plan. And oh my gosh, that's, that's great. Thank you. If I may make a quick comment, I've been incredibly grateful and blessed to have Susan join part of my staff. She's been doing a great job. The moment she came on bo over, she's been taking over the strategic plan and elevated to even a higher level than I thought was possible. So I just want to publicly thank Susan for her hard work so far. Thank you. Any, any other? Oh, uh, Kathy? 
On a quick note, so uh, at the uh, when, after the board approved the strategic plan for this year, we kind of matched board members with different ones of our goals. So when we're ready to start working on those individual goals, if you all will just communicate to us what it is that we, you know, how we participate and engage and what the schedule is for that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. I have a question, oh, oh, just a very quick one regarding the scorecard that I'm very in love with. Uh, are we going to get it this year again? Uh, is there any kind of system as to when we, we get it? So um, in line with the strategic plan and the long-term goals and the strategic objectives, we have developed KPIs, key performance indicators, right. to see where the progress is. Mm -hmm. So it won't be exactly the same as the balanced scorecard, which was you know designed against the previous strategic plan. So right. yes, we do expect to continue to update and sort of um, right. keep everybody informed of the progress that the college is making. Super, because that's and, and you'll present it after each fall and spring semester, because that's where you see the, 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 changes. the changes, yeah. yeah. Yes, and in some cases, the measures make sense to just do a measure annually versus semester. So, you know, not everything would be there, right. but right. yes, right. overall. Super, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've, correct, we've gone over the board and CEO goals. So then we need um, uh, enrollment, enrollment uh, update, enrollment information. <laughs> we, uh, was that a trap? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam President, members of the board. We have a good enrollment report. We are up 4.8%. Uh, and that's, that's looking at our credit hours, our head count is up, our FTE is up, courses are up, and Randy actually can explain the courses better if you, if you have a question about that. <laughs> um, so, we still have all the, um, we still will, will, will have larger numbers than this because we have our, our eight week courses that are just gonna be starting next week. Mm -hmm. So I expect a probably 5% growth. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is really not a pattern in other institutions. Why, why are we doing so well? Because uh, usually it's when people don't have jobs, they come to school, but now that things are kind of settling, we still are growing, so. Well, I saw that Taos grew, CNM grew. I think the community colleges are growing. I know that NMSU lost over 5%. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what UNM did, but um, I think community colleges are still growing, but I think part of this is we really are paying attention and the whole campus is really paying attention to retention. So that, you know, put, that's part of, of, of our growth. And, um, you know, I can't say we've increased our, our dual credit, mm -hmm. which, yeah, we've doubled it because we've taken it to the high school. So that's another way that we've grown. And then I think the 28 certificates that we had that, that we, we took to the Department of Education last year so that they would uh, qualify for financial aid. I think that understanding that having something that doesn't have financial aid is not going to get large attendances. And so those 28 certificates, we'll start looking at them to see how they have increased this year in enrollment because now the students can receive financial aid. And in fact, it's, it's a typical pattern across the country in terms of community colleges. Community colleges now are growing for a whole range of reasons, mm -hmm. many of them that you both have mm -hmm. talked about. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I, I think it's um, it's important also. The word on the street for me is, you know, that the Santa Fe Community College is strutting their stuff. You know, <laughs> they really are, man. You know, it's like, you know, Janet, you know, the, the information's getting out there and, and people know, hey, did you do this? Did You know, I think that's, that's part of it too is to be out there and to have you know to to have the faces of of the community out there i mean it's it's they they talk it up and and our literature and and the information it's out there so that that's good well i have this one is from a week ago it's from last wednesday we get them every wednesday and i have one from this morning so the head count if you look at the bottom one it was the change was 20 was 78 and we have a change of 121 in just a less than a week and um all of those numbers have grown except for yeah credit hours it's we have over 2000 uh credit hours so we're at 4.81 percent in the fte and the credit hours growing in the middle of the semester what's accounting for that or do you still do quite a bit of late registration we are still doing late registration it's mainly been the dual credit students mm -hmm. but we also will be starting next week having a number of short-term courses but the, but the increase here from 78 to 100 and some. oh you mean la from last week yeah. yes it's so just getting caught up with the dual the dual credit numbers mainly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know one thing that I was concerned about from back in the day again when we were doing dual credit was you know that high school students there are some high school students that are not that are gonna slack and and you know that's going to ruin their GPA when they come into the college maybe even have them lose their lottery scholarship and so I, I, I you know I don't know. Is there is there a, any type of extra counseling? Is there something you know, advisors or something that might be there for those students, either through the high school or through the college? Because I saw that as a problem back then. Is it a problem well, I now? I think I think Rebecca has been doing a lot of work with the high schools. They have done a lot of talking. I mean, they have to be approved by a counselor in the high school. To be able to take the course and i think early on they were just letting everybody in and now they're really being selective as to who can take the classes um, we still are having some of those problems and it does impact their their lottery their their it impacts their grade point average so because why that why aren't the high schools giving a grade which is separate from the colleges what is it? The co the college credit is what's it's their the GPA. It's the hours that you have to be eligible for before you can get the lottery scholarship. Right. And so they're getting college credit and high school credit. Right. And so th the grade is probably the same, but it's impacting their their college GPA, which makes them ineligible for the lottery scholarship if they fall too low. Oh. In in the first semester. Right. The first semester. Correct. Yeah, they wouldn't get they wouldn't get whatever whatever name we have for that scholarship that what is it called bridge bridge, bridge. yeah, yeah cause every, bridge. every college has a different yeah. name for it uh, but the bridge scholarship that that means if they've already done dual dual uh, right. dual enrollment dual credit then they won't get the bridge scholarship or they, they may will. not no because they're going for the they're going for the lottery they still have to the, their first semester here even if they have come in with 30 hours they still have to wait the 12 hours even though that 30 hours they may have taken may impact their so if they got a good gpa they will get the bridge scholarship and then the next semester they'll start with the lottery if and be ahead of themselves if they don't have poor grades from right the dual no, credit they yeah. got the gpa and all that yeah. and and will they get the full four years even if they even yes. if they finish you know they've already had 30 credits you know they might get their, their their degree earlier through the lottery and will they be able to use that 
for their four year scholarship or oh they can use it for their four year yeah. to to move on and get a, a bachelor's so they might use one year of lottery and then move on and get three years for that, their upper that was one of the benefits of the lottery was that students would get out of school sooner and so it would be cheaper but we'll see oh uh, just <laughs> okay that that was a that that was always a problem you know and just i'm i'm yeah. glad that we're doing something about it okay that's and it. So, so let me just point out so that so that Randy can defend this. Um, <laughs> something that I worry about is that what you want to see is increase in headcount FT credit hours, but not such an increase in courses, because then you're spending your money on the courses. OK, and so I have asked uh, for them and, and Randy says that they're counting them differently this year. And I just want to make sure because Many colleges get in trouble uh, when they're doing well, and we're doing well, uh, to allow too many small classes uh, that, that then become very expensive. So that's a concern I have that I have asked Randy to resolve for us next month. Yes, I'll, I'll, just a quick comment. She does worry about it, and she does ask me about it every week. So we are working on it. There are a couple of things, though, that are contributed to it. We, do have, a, we have three pages of classes that start next week, and they're part of that 113 mm -hmm. course increase. Some of them are going to be canceled due to low enrollment. So there are going to, some of those are going to disappear. But we've also got a couple of things going on that we didn't have in the past, and that is we have the Sun Online courses where we're buying seats from other institutions that we're paying on a per student basis, but they're still in our catalog as a course. So they might have one person in them or two people in them. We're not paying the full instruction because we're paying the other institution $75 per credit hour. That's what we're doing right now uh, per student. And so that's a course sharing kind of arrangement that we've been working on in there. And then we have a lot more of the internship and practicum type courses that we didn't have before and they often are one person because the start date and the end date are based upon their job experience right. mm -hmm. so we have a lot more of those uh, going on right now too and then we and we have a lot more late starting courses and that's a you consider uh, low enrollment we typically most courses make if they have 10 or more. We would like 12. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a lot, uh, you know, a lot of areas like in the health care areas, eight's the maximum. So we do have a lot of courses that bring our average down because of that. Uh, we do sometimes let some of the upper division courses go because people need them to graduate. If there's too small a number, we'll switch it over to independent studies if need be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to be moving into tab G and um, uh, matters related uh, to the policy. That'll be SFCC social media policy, and that, that was there. Uh, Janet? Mr. Chairman and members of the, of the board, uh, we developed this social media policy because we are in the age of social media and in fact uh, I think we're a little bit behind <laughs> in developing this but uh, what we did was assemble a committee and looked at best practices uh, in community colleges and institutions across the country and modeled this policy after that I'd be happy to answer any questions or if you want me to go through it 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 basically um, states that, that we have a policy uh, that we have a social media <coughs> staff, which is the staff of the marketing and public relations department working in concert with OIT that administers and approves official Santa Fe Community College Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, LinkedIn accounts, et cetera, et cetera. And the way we do that and what this policy uh, gives us is the authority to approve official pages. I can't prevent anyone from establishing a Facebook page on this campus, but what I can do is have a policy that says if you want an approved one, then a member of my staff, myself, or who I um, designate, must be an administrator on <coughs> that page. And is it for uh, faculty and staff only, or does it? 
it pertains to students as well. For instance, uh, student government has their own Facebook page. But official functions, not private. Uh, Correct. Functions. Correct. But, and with the student um, government association, a member of our staff being one of the administrators on that page, we don't look at, we don't approve every posting. We don't go in there and monitor. We don't censor. We don't do any of that. But if something really, really bad happened, uh, we would, uh, if we needed it, have the authority to take a page down. So uh, wait, we have a question over there first. Go ahead, Nikki. Actually, also, there's a couple clubs from here that also have Facebook pages. So how yes. would that be handled? And we don't know about them. <laughs> <laughs> they need to sign up. If this policy passes. <laughs> yes. It, we, we, we try to troll for pages <laughs> that are out there and make uh, uh, people aware of the policy. But it, we are in the age where, uh, you know, it, it is difficult. But, but this policy will at least give us some authority in a case where we would need it. Yes. Sorry, go ahead, Andrea. Who will be reviewing it before we get it for final approval? It has already been through a, a process where it's been posted on Jack. It's gone through the faculty senate, the staff senate, the executive team. Uh, so we've we've had public comment on campus for almost a year. Uh, we've so been working on this. It will so be in this once you in this approve shape. it, so it will be pretty much in this shape next time when yeah. we unless you up. have specific things you would like me to. Yeah. Okay. Do you need to include clubs? Given, um, I, I believe our policy um, uh, is very broad in that all it says all pages officially recognized. So we don't do, we don't go through because any minute now yeah. some <laughs> someone could some new entity. correct <laughs> correct. How, how does how does that policy affect the board and how we communicate or how we deal with the you know stuff that's a very good question mr chairman uh it affects the board in in a couple of different ways if it it gives it gives me uh acting on your behalf the authority if something really bad were to happen on our facebook page to take a page down quickly you you might notice something and call me and say janet have you seen the facebook page there has been some vandalism or something of that nature so we would have the teeth to, to act quickly. Um, if the board decided they wanted a Facebook page. <laughs> that <is> yes. Or <laughs> a Twitter account so that you could all tweet oh, no. on a daily basis. That's all we need. Yes. A Pope tweet. I think I'd just rather tweet on my, in the privacy of my <laughs> Well, you, you would have to approve all those tweets. I, I would. <laughs> uh, if you were, if you ab agreed to abide by this policy, you can tweet away. <laughs> I would know that you were falling under the policy. In, in the last legislative session, there was a bill, and I'm pretty sure it passed and got signed about social media. And oh. I don't really remember what it was about. Mm -hmm. Not on my radar either. I'm it was sorry. Uh, Senator Candelaria's bill. You might just okay, I'll look it check up. it out. Yeah. I can't remember if the governor signed it or not, but it was about institutions, businesses, and social media. Hmm. Worth checking out. Yeah. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, other questions? Uh, Thank you. You know, just the whole thing that I was just worried about is that you know that that the you know, that I as a board member and board chair, you know, that what restrictions do I have or what, you know, that, I mean, it's just, you know, I just, you never know. I just don't want to, you know, I don't want to do the wrong thing or jump into something that, you know, that I don't know. I just don't know. I, I can't even think, think of what it might be, but I just don't want to, I don't want to go there even though I don't know what it is, you know. It just, don't tweet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't anyway. In the in the eight years or so that that I've been with the college and we've had our page up for about five years, there's there has only been one post 
that I know of in this whole time on all of these pages that we blocked. And it was because it was a personal attack on, on, on an employee. So we, we, you know, it, it is very, very rare, but the policy gives us that authority to do that. Yeah, you need that, to do that. Does that mean that on our web page, that if, if, if we decided to, to do a communication on our web page, we could do that? Yes. Oh, cool. That's nice. Okay. Mr. Chair, do you need approval? Do you need a motion? <laughs> no. Nope. Not, not yet. Yes. Not no. yet. No. Next, Next month. month. Next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe we could do words of wisdom from the Santa Fe Community College Board, and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, All right, let's skip that one. Um, so um, we don't have any board reports, discussion, or other business. I have something to say there. Okay. I just want to thank Chair Abeita for entertaining us during the Hispanic Month celebration. And uh, here he is, <laughs> October 8th. It was fantastic. And this was the finest hour. His grandson, Adea. This is the other grandson and the little girl. They're beautiful kids. But Adea Gonzalez uh, sang with his grandfather. And he sang Mañanitas with the voice of an angel. It was there he is, just a beautiful little child. And thank you so much, because it made my day. Oh, it was beautiful. Thank you. To have my grandchild know that he's going to be the keeper of the flame. Oh, yes. Singing Las Mañanitas. He didn't even speak <laughs> Spanish yet. And oh. he sang it. He sang all the words. And, and um, just a beautiful voice. Just like now, it, made, it makes me cry. Andrea, you made me cry. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. I do that sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'd like to announce the next meeting. We're going. We're going to have um, a full day meeting on the October twenty second. Correct. Mm -hmm. And and do we have a location for that? Yeah. Uh, it's going to be in the board breakout room. Okay. And then our next board meeting is going to be on the nineteenth. And we might have something concerning the fiscal, or no? To what should, might there be another meeting or? I don't think so. No. Isn't okay. there a joint? Uh, that when is that joint? Is, is that one? It's November. That's it's November, November 19th. That's in November. Yeah. November, November 19th. 19th yes. Okay, so that'll be in November 19th. All right. And um, I love that picture. Thank you. Sorry. I just, <laughs> you know. Qué bendición. Es una bendición de Dios. A tener los niños que canten conmigo. I love it. Um, okay. And. Um, I, I don't, are we going into closed session? Yes. yes. Okay. So do we have a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Second? We have to read the whole Second. Thing. All right. Uh, though all those, uh, 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 I can't even talk anymore. You got me all. <laughs> Look behind you. Uh, <laughs> Aye. Aye. Okay. We're going to go into closed session. Thank you.